I live in a relatively large county in southwestern Virginia, and there's a lot of old rundown buildings and shacks that are usually unlocked and relatively safe to enter. I mean this as in the buildings still have some support to keep the house from caving in. It was the middle of summer, and being the edgy teenager I was, a few friends and I decided to go to an abandoned house that was just on the cusp of the wood line next to our houses. The neighbourhood this took place in always made me feel off. I've had some really weird experiences there, and had only lived there just shy of six months. I get my trusty book knife, my buddy, and his sister's boyfriend, and we go toward the house. There's a small field before you get there, and the grass is never cut, so we have to take our time and tread lightly, so we wouldn't get bit by snakes that are passing through. But with every step, I felt heavier and heavier. It felt like maybe I should back, but I didn't want to be a wuss and my buddy and HSBF. I don't feel like writing it, you get the gist. We're having fun and joking about it. So I played along. We eventually get to the house and I hadn't been touched in years. I emphasize years because there were boxes full of newspapers from the late 60s and early 70s that were still in place as if the owner had just decided to up and leave. We start looking around and are just screwing around, doing what teenagers do, when we all stop and look at each other. I don't know why we all thought to do that. It seemed like they were waiting for something. My buddy cracks a joke and we all just go back to what we were doing. We look around some more and found an old Bible that was read regularly, a couple of broken glasses and a shattered picture of a couple that was in black and white. I noticed it and wanted to take a look, but when I reached down to it, we heard a quiet whisper of a, get out. We thought we were psyching ourselves out, so we continued on. But now I'm sure not to have a thought of touching something. And we opened the door to what I presume to be the bedroom. It looked like someone had stripped all of the flooring. After the door, it went straight to dirt. No floor, subfloor, anything. And then we look up and see a noose hanging from a beam from the ceiling. It scared me shitless. We didn't have a word to say. We all looked at each other and I shut the door. We didn't want anything to do with that room. The building was a two story house and the stairs were still intact. But we noticed that there was shattered glass and blood on the steps. We started to get really freaked out at this point, but I decided to try to walk up the steps. And that's when I saw an old mason jar shatter in front of me and a quiet whisper behind my ear that said in a low menacing tone, Leave now. I run my chubby ass out the door with the, my friends following closely behind. I hightailed it out through the field. I didn't even care about the snakes. We meet up at the end of the field at the edge of the road and we look back at the window and we see an apparition slowly disappear at the front door. Me and my friends made a promise to never ever set foot there again. And we haven't since. It's been six years since this occurred and we're still friends. We joke around about it now, even dubbing the Kent House Ghost our road name. But I still get chills when I think about the words, leave now. So I'm living in the house that I grew up in, and this has happened for years, and I've just always brushed it off. But until my wife brought something up about it, I thought I was crazy. So the house is a two-story country home, built in 1973, and it's only had three owners, my great-grandfather, my mother, and myself. So no way is there a fact that someone who we didn't know passed away there. The only death that has ever occurred in this house was my great-grandfather in 2005, who died in the room I sleep in from lung cancer. I was always terrified to stay in my room when I was younger for one particular reason. The door would always slam shut if it was cracked or fling open when it's halfway open. Let me give you backstory. My great grandfather always hated doors not being one way or the other. You either have them opened or closed, no in between. I barely knew the man, so I couldn't tell you why this is. So I feel as if it's him doing this, but I couldn't be sure. Another weird thing is that a main air duct is located behind one certain door in the main hall that lets much of the heat or AC in constantly opens as if someone wants to use the heat or AC they're paying for. And this will happen at random. 
if it's on or off, day or night. And the weird thing is, it doesn't just fling open. My wife and I have both observed the doorknob turn and open, as if someone's opening it. It's crazy, and I'll have to try and record it. The final thing that's weird is that my basement door, which has a slide lock and a door lock on it, in which I double check every night to make sure it is locked, constantly opens in the middle of the night, and I can hear it creak open, weirdly, in my dreams occasionally. I see him in my dreams, but I have no idea what's causing all of this. My name is Nancy Poitou. A colleague referred this case to me. In this case, there was an apartment building where there was a mother and daughter who lived in a loft. The daughter woke up one night to see a black man standing over her bed. The little girl's mother told her therapist, who told her about me, and she told the apartment manager. The therapist gave her client my contact information, and she passed it on to the apartment manager. By this time, the mother and daughter had both moved out. Oddly enough, the date I was asked to do my ghost busting thing landed on Halloween. I asked a friend of mine to come with me, as I usually do someone who's intuitive and spiritual to do with this with particular ghost busting events. The apartment manager had done some research and discovered that the building was very old, and many years ago it was a courthouse and jail. I appreciate any information that I'm given about the place I'm investigating, because I'm not out to prove anything to anyone. I just want to help the people who live there and the ghost or ghosts as in this case. My friend Maria and I got there and met with the apartment manager, who took us up to the loft. When I walked in, I quickly realized it wasn't just one ghost, but closer to a dozen, which surprised me. I said this to the apartment manager and asked if she wanted to say. Her response was something like, oh, hell no. I laughed and she took off. I was taught to never, ever be afraid in these situations. If the entities are negative, they will feed off fear. When I go to do ghost busting, my intention is to help all those living and dead to find peace. I find that when come in this intention and energy, I don't encounter any problems, at least not so far. So the first thing I used to do is investigate, meaning walking around the property in an altered state and see what I pick up while my friend does the same. She agreed there were more than one and probably a dozen ghosts inhabiting the space. What I saw in my mind's eye was that we used to call hobos. Hobos were men who were homeless, especially during the Great Depression and who rode the railroads by covertly hitching a ride in the 30s and 40s. As a young girl, I remember warnings from my mother to stay away from the railroad tracks. I didn't understand why at the time, but my mother who lived through the Great Depression as a young girl knew about hobos. Just like today's homeless, there are some who can present a danger. I much later realized mom wanted me to avoid hobos. One definition of hobo is a migrant worker or homeless vagrant, especially one who is impoverished. The term originated in the western, probably northwestern United States around 1890. Unlike a tramp who works when only forced to, and a bum who does no work at all, a hobo is a traveling worker. Along with the dozen or so hobo ghosts in the former jail, was also a policeman. I could see the jail cell and the hobos in, in the policemen all talking, telling stories and joking. I was surprised to find that it did not seem like a prisoner guard relationship that I would normally expect. It seemed more friendly and informal almost, like the guard was there to supervise rather than guard dangerous prisoners. Because the dozen or so hobos were earthbound spirits, it occurred to me that although possible, it was unlikely that they all died there. The apartment manager who did some research did not mention any events that would have resulted in them all dying there at the same time. But for some reason, it seemed to me they came back. Perhaps because it was a friendly, warm environment in what must have been some pretty depressing lives. Many years later, I learned that back in the 30s and 40s, police departments would open their jails for these hobos to have a warm place to sleep and a meal. I didn't know this at the time I was visiting this loft, which is why I was somewhat confused by the energy of the relationship being so friendly. Once I determine what's going on in a location, I then attempt to communicate with the ghosts or earthbound spirits. 
Until I'm shown otherwise or experience otherwise, I assume that the souls that are stuck in a place between our physical plane and the next, which ghosts or earthbound spirits. An earthbound spirit is a soul that has died and in some cases doesn't know what they, doesn't know that they have died. Sometimes earthbound spirits have died under very traumatic circumstances. They're scared and confused and are unable to perceive the light and so are unable to make their way into the light and get to the portal to the other side. What earthbound spirits need in these cases is someone to help them find the light, the path to the other side. Sometimes they need to tell their story and that alone can release them from being stuck between worlds. Some earthbound spirits are just unwilling to move on to the next place for one reason or another. Sometimes it's a guilt, a horrific loss, a traumatic death, or simply being very attached to a place. Souls don't always stay at the place where they died. They sometimes go back to a place where they have good memories or where an important life event or good or bad happened. This was my conclusion about the hobos. The energy felt camaraderie and acceptance. My next step is to go into an altered state to communicate with the ghosts. There seems to be no re reason other than the camaraderie and positive feelings they had about each other and the location that drew them back here and was keeping them there. My friend Mar Maria did a ritual to open a portal. I laid down on the cement floor and went into an altered state. I think of it as entering into their space. I think they telepathically know I'm there to help because I usually encounter very little resistance. I communicated with the policeman who was wearing an old fashioned police uniform with the kind of hat that was flat on top with multiple straight edges around it and a shiny brim in front. I mentally explained that they seemed stuck there and told the policeman that I was there to help them move on. I then asked him to lead the way through the portal. He hesitated, saying that these men were his responsibility, and he, he went first. He was not sure they would all follow him. So I said, okay, and have them go through the portal first, so you can make sure that they all go through before you step through. So the policeman told the hobos to line up. I was surprised that they were so compliant and got on a single file line, each one putting his right hand on the shoulder of the person in front of him. I mentally asked them to look for the light and directed their attention to where Maria opened the portal. I said it may look small at first, but keep your eyes on the light and it will get closer and closer. And so in a line they began to walk through the portal and lastly I saw the policeman follow. It's at that point that the spirit guides and loved ones of the earthbound spirits can then take over, guide them into the afterlife. Having been a hospice volunteer, I've seen people have deathbed visions where guides and relatives who have passed on before them come to get them. But sometimes in the case of the earthbound spirits, their vibration is too low for them to see the light. Spirit guides, friends and relatives. That's where the need for someone like me comes in so that I can get them to a point where they can now see the spirits who are there or at the portal. My next step in ghost busting is now to remove any negative energy and to raise the vibration of the place. So first I use a smudge stick, which is a Native American tradition to remove negative energy. It's made up of dried and bundled sage, in some cases sage and cedar. You light the end of it with a lighter, allowing it to burn for about 30 seconds, and then you blow out the flame and it keeps smoking. As a white person, I use a turkey feather to direct the smoke. Native Americans use, these other, use other kinds of feathers, like eagle feathers, which are not only to be used by Native Americans. I use the feather to direct the smoke of the burning sage as I walk around the house or apartment, or in then, this case, the loft. Since there were no furnishings, I focused on walking around the inside wall, smudging as I go. The next step in removing negative energy is the use of unrefined salt. I sprinkled a little salt along the inside walls of the loft. The salt will soak up any remaining negative energy and needs to be vacuumed up in a couple weeks. My next step is to raise the vibration. This is like changing the energetic address. This is what keeps earthbound spirits from returning to the place. I do this by first burning incense. This is what keeps earthbound spirits from returning to the place. 
I use resin, incense, and again use a turkey feather to direct the smoke of the incense around the inside of the walls. There are other things one can be used to raise the vibration like classical music, spiritual symbols and photographs or artwork of positive spiritual images or people. Another step is to use the frankincense oil. I have a little jar which I'll dip my finger into it and say a blessing over the doors and the windows, making a cross with the frankincense oil. I sometimes leave behind a copy of the prayer of protection. But in this case, because the loft was uninhibited, I only used the incense, the frankincense oil and meditation. In the meditation, I say the prayer protection and visualize a white light enveloping the domicile. I also usually use a white candle, the kind that is in a tall jar. I anoint it with frankincense oil and light it while saying the prayer protection. But again, because this place was empty, I didn't want to leave a burning candle. If it's an occupied home, I'll give the occupants instructions about vacuuming up the salt and letting the white candle stay lit until it's burnt all the way to the bottom and goes out on its own. I instruct the occupants that when they leave the house to put the candle in a shower or bathtub, where even if it's knocked over, it won't start a fire. Allowing the candle to burn down to the bottom continuously, I don't want the ritual to be broken. So rather than have it broken, I didn't in this case use a white candle. Marie and I did the meditation. The more people who join in, the more power it has. So when there is an occupant, I will also involve them in the meditation. When I do a ghost busting session like this, I offer a money back guarantee. The reason I do this is because I want to know if what I'm doing is working or not. And as I said, in the beginning, my intention is to help both living and dead. And if I haven't been able to help them, I don't think they should have to pay for it. The next day I spoke with the apartment manager and told her what had gone on and what I discovered. I told her about the money back guarantee and if there were any more problems to please call me. She assured me that she would. It's been years and I haven't heard from her, so I wouldn't say it was a success. I couldn't think of a better way to spend Halloween than just do some real life ghost hunting. One day, I was sitting in my living room to the right of where I was sitting is the door that leads to the kitchen. All I had to do was lean forward to look into the kitchen and I could see through the kitchen to the back door. I was also able to see in the opposite direction, the front door. So I'm sitting there and I hear the back door open and close. I lean forward and look, but I see nothing. I hear footsteps that sounded like men's boots. As usual, rather than visually see something, I see it in my mind's eye. What I saw this day was a cowboy. He walked straight from the back door through the dining area through the kitchen and stopped at the doorway right next to where I was seated. It felt as though we sort of looked at each other and shrugged. Okay, I said to myself, that just happened. And then he continued to walk through the living room and I heard the front door open and close. Neither the back door nor the front door moved, but I know the sound of my own back door and my own front door when they open and close. My house is not haunted and this had never happened before or since. From knowing the history and the city I live, the area where my house is was a very long time ago, the red light district. So it's my conjecture that this cowboy was looking for the brothel. When he didn't find it, he just kept on walking. It seemed obvious to me, or it felt to me like he could see my house and he could see me and was somewhat confused as I was in the moment. I was taught to never be afraid of ghosts because if they were negative entities, they would feed off the fear. I've never been afraid, startled maybe, but never afraid. So this was just one of those things that happened that was interesting, but I was not the least bit frightened or upset. It was just a day where a spirit walked through my house looking for the brothel. When I was 10, I woke up and saw a lady watching me. I was on the top bunk. I could only see shoulders up. She had long blonde hair and was wearing a blue pink dress. She had a neutral expression. She looked like she was painted on a cell phone. I tried to scream and nothing came out. She disappeared and I jumped out of my bed and ran really fast downstairs. My parents got out photo albums and asked if I saw her in any of them. 
I didn't. They said not to be afraid. Seeing people who have died is a gift. I said I didn't want it. They heard of a local lady who had the gift. They arranged a meeting. Sounds like a good idea. Oh my god, she scared the shit out of me. Eventually, as I got older, the lady was very helpful. The reason I share my experience is my parents didn't call me a liar. Instead, they had me meet with someone to help me understand what was going on. I had my first and only migraine hit while my rescue parrots thought it was a good time for all of them to vocalize. Screeching at the top of their lungs. I kept asking them to stop, but they wouldn't. There were about six here at the time. I had to sit down because I feel like I was going to vomit. My house has a history of unusual activity. I said, okay, if someone is really here, please make them stop. I can't take it. Within seconds, total silence. Such relief. I said thank you. The parrots actually remained quiet for the rest of the day. A friend said she would have run out of the house, lol. Side note, all those up for adoption have been adopted and living their best bird lives. If it's okay to add another story as to why I believed someone was here. It only happened to family and close friends who were here a lot. Sometimes when using the bathroom, the door wouldn't open no matter how hard you tried. It was like it was cemented closed, no give at all. Well, until you said please out loud, the door would open easily. It was so funny the first time it happened to someone. At least they locked us in instead of out. So they weren't cruel, lol. But this is why I asked if you are here, please stop the birds. It's nice to have a friend, even if I can't see them. I think my animals see whoever it is, but the animals aren't afraid of them. When I was 14, I was riding my bike down the street on which I live and was going past my neighbor's house. It's a small single wide trailer and used for selling drugs and other bad stuff. Nobody actually lives there except for the dealer, but people visit all the time to buy and sell. I always sped past his house because these people creeped me out, but this time nobody was home, so I didn't need to hurry. I glanced over at the trailer and saw a cute girl on the patio porch that was added on. She waved at me. I waved back and that was that. A few weeks later, I saw the girl in the yard of the neighbor's house and she looked over at me and waved again, this time with a smile that just stuck with me. My brother was knelt right next to me, trying to get a go-kart started. So I asked if he knew her name and if she lived in the trailer. He had no idea who I was talking about, which didn't surprise me because I figured he was preoccupied and didn't see her. I didn't see her again for three years, and by then I rarely thought of her. So by this point of the story, I'm 17, or nearly 17, I'm not sure. And at my other neighbor's second house, he owned two, a real nice two-story and trailer right next to that one. The neighbor I'm currently talking about, let's call him R. Let my family use half his property for gardening. It's late summer and the garden is in full bloom. I'm checking the cucumbers on the far side of the garden and glance over to my house. I see the mystery girl standing by the swimming pool turned koi pond and instinctively yell out to her to call her over. Maybe she wants some fresh vegetables. She didn't respond, so I set the basket of cucumbers I'm holding down, dust myself off and start to water. But she's already gone. I notice my family looking confused as to why I suddenly yell out, hey, but simply said I saw a friend drive by. It took a few seconds for me to realize this, but every time I'd seen her over the years, she was always wearing the same clothes. I found that odd, but decided it might just have been remembered incorrectly. I saw her once more that year, but that time may have been a dream, so I won't go into detail on that. Now we're in the present, well, technically three days ago, and I saw her again. After a long day of fencing a goat pen, I decided to head in the house and grab my pocket knife out of my room. I tried finding my knife earlier that day but gave up because I didn't really need it at the time. I went down the hallway, opened my bedroom door and turned on the light. And what I saw was terrifying, but strange enough for very long. She was sitting on my bed and just turned to look at me. 
She then did what was done almost every time I'd seen her, smile at me and calling wave. It looked like she thought the situation I had found myself in was perfectly normal and I found that incredibly soothing. I stood in my doorway for what felt like 15 seconds before I had the frame of mind to finally speak. What's your name? I asked her. Her lips appeared to have slightly moved, as if she was about to answer, but she didn't. Do you know me? I asked. She actually answered this time, and I swear I felt like I've heard her voice a million times. It just sounded unbelievably familiar. I'm not sure, but I think so. My dad opened the door and yelled to see what was talk taking me so long. So I turned to shout and tell him I'm still looking for my knife, which is totally believable because I lose it quite often. When I turned around, I'm saddened to see that she is no longer in the room with me, but the comforter on my bed clearly shows signs that someone has sat on it. I don't know what to do. If she is a ghost, then that would mean she's dead. If she's not a ghost, then what is she? Who is she? Why me? I have no idea who she is. All I know is, she's had a strange impact on me. When I see her, I feel an inexplicable sense of calm wash over me. And when I think of her, I just feel sad because she seems so lonely and lost. If she knows me, maybe we were friends in a past life. Or perhaps she's had me confused for someone else and is simply waiting on the wrong person to join her in the afterlife. If that's so, then what am I supposed to do? Anything? I've searched missing persons reports from my town and nearby, but turns out none of them match her appearance. Short but mildly curly blonde hair, bright pale but not too, too pale skin, slightly shorter than me. I'm 5'7 to 5'8. Orange tank top, short blue jean shorts, brown shoestring like belt, a silver necklace with a wolf head sticking in its tongue out, green eyes, and a bracelet with Kanji or Hansi characters on her right wrist. I've searched Facebook for a profile with her picture and found nothing. I know this probably sounds to many like complete bullshit and that's perfectly fine. I myself have never had any sort of ghost encounter before this. There was one time I heard someone whisper my name when I was trying to sleep, but I assumed that was one of my brothers trying to scare me. Another time in third grade, I woke up to find that I had a black eye. Most of my supernatural experiences are a result of my reoccurring sleep paralysis, from which I've suffered for many years. But none of my encounters with this girl can be explained by sleep paralysis. They weren't dreams either. While I do have very realistic dreams in which I can smell, taste and feel everything, and often have control of my actions, my dreams are almost always in third person perspective. And when I wake up, there's a clear distinction between my dreamscape and reality. The house that my mum used to live at for around five or six years was haunted horribly. We lived above a store and in our second year of living there, some people brought the store and turned it into a weave shop. Something we later found out was that there were drug deals going on down there and something else we couldn't figure out. We told the landlord about what was going on and he, the people pack up and move. Once they did, move we began to notice that there were voices and other types of sounds coming from the store area and eventually that began to come up to our area of the building. The weirdest encounter I've had with a spirit was when I do laundry in the basement below the shop and there would be this shadow cloaked man with a fedora hat on and he'd just kind of chill in the corner of the basement and just watch. If I ever acknowledge him then he'd just fade away into the shadows. After I moved to do school with my aunt in Georgia, my mum and brother would tell me that all the stuff that would occur while I was gone. We confirmed that demons do inhabit the building as well, as a little girl looking spirit. A man that looks to be from 1913, and a scary as fuck skinny grey thing that looks similar to SCP-096, but if you put long and untamed black hair on it. This story takes place quite a few years ago when I was turning six or seven. I can't remember exactly. Anyway, this was my first birthday party and I had invited some friends. We'll call them M, K, B and S for the purpose of this story. We had just gotten back to my house and I asked everyone what they wanted to do. S spoke up and said we should play Bloody Mary. 
I was pretty against the idea since I heard the story and didn't want some ghost in my bathroom. But since everyone else was down, I went along with the idea, though I refused to actually go in. So S, K and B all went into the main bathroom. The layout of my house was the main bathroom with a door leading into the hallway on the right and a sliding door leading to the parents' bedroom on the left. This will be important later. So M and I are sitting in the living room. I was huddled in a blanket because I was a wuss. We suddenly heard the others screaming and trying to open the door. I immediately ran to the hallway door, locked. I went to the parents' bathroom door, also locked. Did I forget to mention the hallway door couldn't lock and the sliding door was locked from the parents' bathroom? It couldn't be locked and then shut you had to lock it when it was closed. So I was freaking out and crying because I thought my friends were goners. What felt like the longest few seconds of my life passed by the hallway door was flung open and S, K and B almost tripped over themselves running out the bathroom. I was so relieved to see them and we all stood in the living room allowing them to catch their breath before explaining what happened. Things had started to calm down when S, whose back was facing the bathroom hallway at the time, started complaining about her back feeling like it was burning. We looked at each other before asking her to turn around so we can look at her back. We lift her shirt only to find an angry face starting to appear just under her right shoulder blade. The angry face looked freshly scratched and it was starting to bleed like someone with sharp fingernails had scratched her only moments earlier. What makes us even weirder is that none of us were near her back and she was the only person who had played the game multiple times with no consequences. That is where the story ends. Years later, M tried to tell me it was a prank, but I don't believe her. I remember it too well to even think it was faked. Their screams, the fear in their eyes, the mark on S and the fear I felt in that bathroom every time afterwards was enough to convince me it was real. As I said, I always felt something in that bathroom, especially when the lights were off. So I gained the habit of always opening the door before I flush and wash my hands. It was pretty funny telling my mom that, because she'd always wondered why I did that. When I was six or seven years old and I woke up one night, I'm not sure of the time, I just know that Leno was on. I saw what I thought was my brother standing on our dresser reaching for my Batman 1989 piggyback that came with the cereal. I was proud of it because it had $12 in it I'd been saving to buy a Ninja Turtle. I don't know what made me think it was my brother. We both have very dark brown hair, almost black, but whoever was on the dresser was blonde, was wearing pajamas neither of us owned, and was internally glowing. Yeah, he was lit up in the dark room, but somehow wasn't casting any light. The room was totally dark. Anyway, I see this thing reaching for my bank and I think it's my brother trying to steal my money. I say, Joe, go to sleep. I wait a couple seconds and say it again and then again. On the third time, he turns and looks at me, still standing on the dresser. I get louder, Joe, go to sleep. Then I had it. I said, Joey, come on, go to sleep. As I removed my blanket and turned on the lamp, as soon as I turned the lamp on, it disappeared. I felt the blood leave my face. I let out a death scream and run downstairs to find my dad and brother watching TV, Leno. And I cry myself to sleep in my dad's arms, screaming about the ghost. That was the first and not the last time I've seen this stuff. This happened many years ago, as I was house shopping and recommend, recommended by my real estate agent to look at this new listing. The house was maybe 30 years old, ranch style, empty, clean, and in reasonably good shape, although it was dated in appearance. So we're walking around checking the bedrooms and talking about the price and condition. I have an odd feeling of being watched by someone, especially in the bedrooms, as if someone was standing close to my face. I usually don't have those vibes. We continued into the living room and kitchen area and the feeling continues, but more like being watched from a distance. I finally said to the agent, I feel like someone is watching us in here. I've been feeling it since about we walked in. Oh really? Hmm. As he looked around nervously. I paused for a few seconds to check my feelings. Did someone dying here? I can feel them. There's more than one. 
My Hispanic real agent, real agent turning ghost white. Yeah, how do you know? It was an elderly couple in a murder-suicide. It's them. The mom was in the bedroom, and the wife is watching us from the living room. I think it's best we leave them in peace. Never had that feeling before or since. I work in a print shop in North Central Arkansas. I believe it's haunted. Nothing demonic, kinda fun and friendly. One goes far as saying Casper. It pokes me on the shoulder when I look around, no one is there. I get to work 30 to 45 minutes sooner than the other three gents that work there. Pokes are not the only thing that happens. Oh no, lights will turn on or off, doors will slowly open or close, paper boxes will fall off shelves. Coffee aroma before I've even made coffee. My mom passed two and a half years ago, and before my dad took the recliner out one of the office room, we had the recliner locker would rock by itself. I'm not the only one who saw that. My daughter and co-worker did too. So my daughter and I had to go to work tonight to finish up a large project. I got up there first, about 15 minutes, to pull my daughter and her friend shut up. I was hearing some whispering going on in the back rooms of the print shop. I just froze because my daughter still hadn't gotten there, so I knew it wasn't her. She came walking through the door five minutes later. My daughter got there. We were working on our project and my daughter said, Hey mom, I just heard Papa's chair rolled across the floor. Is anyone else here? I was too chicken to go up and check the situation out. So she did. She grabs Papa's chair and sits in it to do her job. 10 minutes ago, She's seen the shadow by the back door. Keep in mind, me, my daughter and her friend are the only people here. Then we hear a big bang like someone dropped something in the office, but it was near the front of the office where it was all dark. We hurried up and finished our project so we could go home. This only happens in the evening hours. When I get there in the morning before anyone else, I don't have this problem of feeling like people are watching me. I don't hear noises too much, if any at all. I don't have this overwhelming sense of darkness or doom when I'm in there in the morning hours. I just don't know why it only happens at night. It wasn't like it was dark outside yet. It was 7.30 in the evening, no darker outside than it was 7.30 in the morning. It's the same amount of light pouring in the office. My bachelor's degree was in philosophy and I was taught by Dominican friars, a Catholic religious order dating back to the 13th century. None of them were from the Dominican Republic. The philosophy department had this tradition at the, at the end of each semester, we would drive up to a cottage or chalet in the woods. It would be the students and one of the friars as a chaperone to make sure we didn't do anything stupid. The trip was at the end of the winter semester, which was my favorite time to go since the cottage had a wood burning fireplace. There's really nothing special about it, except that it's built on land that the Dominicans have owned since the 1800s. The parcel of land used to be much bigger, but it's been sold off over the centuries to various farmers and ranchers. Except for this forest. The cottage sits overlooking a river on one side, but the other three sides are hemmed in by thick woods. To get to it, you have to drive up a winding country road and then to this locked gate. Only the Dominicans have the key to it, so the friar chaperone would get out his car to unlock it for the rest of us. Once you get past the gate, there's an L-shaped road, with the short part of the L connected to the main country road, and the long part of it leading up to the cottage. I love this little road because it's bordered on either side with trees that lean over. It reminds me of vaulted ceilings in a church or arcways. Or, now looking back, like the trees themselves are leaning over you hunched and watching, listening. So we've done this a few times now. This is my fourth and last time up the cottage because I'm graduating this semester. I'll admit that I miss it a lot. Drunkardly arguing with philosophy students is something I never want to do again. But at the same time, I remember it fondly. We were drinking heavily when we decided it was a good idea to start walking on the frozen river. Five of us venture out further and further from the shoreline, egging each other on until the dumbest or bravest or most drunk of us starts running at top speed to the middle of the fucking water. We start calling out to him to come back, but he keeps going farther and farther away. 
We've been hearing the ice crack under our feet for a while now, so none of us dare go to there to grab him. From the shoreline behind us, we see the Dominican friar and the rest of the students gather and they start yelling at us to come back. We start our way over to them, hoping that the idiot will follow us, which thank fuck he did. When we get back, the chaperone was fuming. He started cursing us out in French and English and told the rest of the students to go back inside while he dealt with us five. He explained to us that what we did was stupid, irresponsible and dangerous that the current was pretty fast and if we'd fallen through the ice, that would have been it. His voice got quieter as he explained that some Dominicans have drowned in the river over the centuries, that we shouldn't fuck around and that we should have known better. We head back to the cottage and take things easy. We stop drinking and after a few hours of talking, board games and snacks, the chaperone tells us that it's light out, time to sleep. I wake up first in the morning and decide to go for a run and down the L-shaped road. It hit snow during the night, but the morning was pretty mild. I step over still sleeping students and leave as quietly as I can. I'm dumb, but I'm not an arsehole. Drunk people deserve their sleep. I do a few laps, reaching the gate in the main road before running back to the cottage. About the ninth lap, I start getting tired and decide that the tenth one will be my last. I reach the gate for the last time and start running up the short road of the L before turning right and running up the long road. About halfway, I get the feeling that I'm being watched. I stop my run, pause my music and turn around. They were standing completely still at the end of the road. It was like an upright shadow. There were no features, no distinctions, just pitch black. I didn't feel scared, just confused and a little startled that someone might have snuck up on me while I was running. I didn't even think they were looking at me. I thought they had their back turned and their jacket hood up. That's the only explanation I had for not being able to see a face. I tried to rationalise it as someone who maybe came to birdwatch or something. Because why else would anyone be standing completely still in a forest in the middle of winter? I start walking away, looking over my shoulder from time to time. Nothing happened, but I felt like they wanted to come closer. I felt this pressure on the back of my neck increase the further I walked away. I felt the need to keep looking back at them even though it didn't move. Maybe to make sure that it was still at the end of the road and not right behind me. When I finally reach the end of the long road and I look back for the last time. As I stare at it, slowly, it starts raising its left hand. It was watching me the entire time. They hold up and they wait. I don't want to raise my hand back. I don't want to greet it or worse, welcome it into my life. At the same time, I didn't want to piss them off by ignoring it. I decided to cross my right arm across my chest and bow my head slightly, never letting it out of sight. I figure they will understand it as, I acknowledge that you are there and I see you, but I don't want anything else to happen. I stay in the little bow and wait. After a few seconds, it slowly lowers its hand and then melts into the fucking tree line. Melts, just fucking evaporates into the shadows of the trees around it. I let out a breath that I didn't realize I was holding in and book it to the cottage. My heart was pounding and my knees were weak. Everybody else was still asleep, so I head to the kitchen and wait for the others to wake up. I gather a few of my friends when they wake up, the guys who were with me on the frozen river, and we walk down the road. We reach the bend where I saw it and no footprints, no butt marks. Just the ones I made on my run, which were well away from the spot it was standing on. Because I'm a lazy fuck and hug the corner on the right to make the run a little easier and quicker. My friends joked that I must have seen one of the Dominicans that drowned. So that was the day I saw the black Dominican. This story was told by my mama many times when I was growing up. To lay a bit of foundation, my mama grew up in a little spot on the map in rural Mingo County, West Virginia, named Molan. The family was dirt poor and mama and her brothers and sisters often went hungry. The family's only close neighbor was an old lady that everyone referred to as Aunt Kate. The old woman lived alone and had what I assume was cataract because mama said her eyes were white. Aunt Kate's husband was serving time in the state penitentiary at Moundsville for murder. Anyway, due to their near constant need for food, Mama's dad planted a vegetable garden. 
The plot of land that they used was a good piece from the old home place where they lived. My mama said this one particular summer was very hot and that copperhead snakes were abnormally active. Because my mama loved her daddy, she reported that she would follow him everywhere. On this particular day, my great grandfather and my mama pushed a large wooden cart to the garden and collected some of the vegetables that were ready to eat. My mama said that due to the heat and the difficulty of pushing the large wooden cart to and from the spot, that the two of them were worn out. As they neared the home place, they had to go by Aunt Kate's home, and as luck would have it, the old woman was setting out on a porch as they wheeled the cart by. As the two nearly pushed the cart by without incident, they heard the old woman holler out, Harrison, give me some of those beans. Due to the difficulty that it took to raise, pick, and transport the vegetables, my great-grandfather replied, We worked hard for these beans, and I'm not going to give them away. The old woman giggled and replied, Well, you wish you did. Thinking nothing of the old woman's threat, my mama and her daddy continued on their journey and carried on the evening without thinking about what was said. That night, everyone went to bed. My mama had six or seven siblings and shared a bed. Oftentimes, the older siblings would force the younger onto the floor to sleep. So this particular night, as most, my mama was on the floor to sleep. She said that as she began to fall asleep, she heard it. Something began towards her room from the hallway. Now she knew the sounds her mother and father made as they moved within the old slapboard house. Because of this, she immediately used what cover she had to pull over her head. According to her, whatever was walking continued through the hallway and into her room and would stop where her head was laying on the floor, covered up. It would then turn after a few seconds and continue back into the hallway where it would disappear, only to return back down the hallway to where she lay. Mama said that this happened all night long. She told me that she lay there paralyzed with fear all night long. As the sun arose, whatever was walking disappeared and she heard her daddy moving around. She stated that she immediately jumped up and ran to where her father was. Mama said that as she entered where daddy was at, he was putting on his shoes. When he saw her, the two locked eyes and she immediately knew where the thing was going when it left her room. When her daddy had finished putting on his shoes, he immediately went and put a bunch of green beans in a poke and headed out the door towards old Aunt Kate's house, Mama following after him. As they approached the old woman's house, they noticed that she was sitting out on her porch, as if waiting on something or someone. Mama said that her daddy tossed the beans up onto the porch and proclaimed, Old woman, take your booger back. To which the old woman smiled and said, Don't worry Harrison, it won't bother you again. I was raised by my mama and watched her life as an example. She was a devout Christian and lived it. I never saw her drink, curse, or do anything that she thought was a sin. I was made to go to church nearly every time the doors were open. She always claimed that the story of old Aunt Kate was the truth, and I believed her. This happened about seven years ago. I was living in an apartment with my fiance, my two roommates, two cats and my dog, Titan. It was probably our second week in the apartment. We usually sleep around midnight. I randomly woke up in the middle of the night around 3 a.m. I started to go back to sleep and I felt rumbling near my legs. My dog was low growling. He's a large dog, a pit bull, husky, rottweiler, lab mix, 110 pounds. We usually leave the bedroom door cracked and held in place so Titan has free reign of the house to patrol at night if he is so inclined, and we still mostly have privacy. Just outside my door, I hear a little girl's voice say, come play with me. Titan keeps growling and I practically stop breathing and my heart starts racing. My girlfriend says, did you hear that? I breathed a sigh of relief and said, oh, thank God you're awake too. We waited for a good 30 minutes and didn't hear anything before going back to sleep. Titan stopped growling after a couple minutes and laid his head back down. The next night, the same thing happened again around 3am. 
This time Titan immediately leaped out of bed and ran out of the bedroom snarling viciously. It never happened again. That's the only paranormal experience I've ever had. But my fiance has a couple as well. Maybe she's a ghost magnet or something. So I started dating this girl. She lives with her sister and her husband. She's a huge believer in the supernatural. I not so much even now. Wanted to move in with them and away from my parents, but I had to prove myself before I could. They were leaving to go to Mobile, Alabama for the 4th of July and had asked me to watch the dogs and keep the house clean while they were away. Before they had left for Mobile, I was laying in bed with my girlfriend watching TV and I could hear knocking in the closet. The closet is next to the bathroom, so I'm thinking it's the pipes. I chuck chuckled and knocked back. My girlfriend looked at me stone cold and told me to never aggravate her. I didn't care and did it again. Went to bed, woke up and went to work. Came back later and there's a note on the table saying they'd left and there was booze in the fridge. Took the dogs out, had a few drinks and went to bed. Later that night I'm alone in the house with the dogs in my girlfriend's bedroom. The dogs start freaking out and wake me up, both standing in the bed facing the closet door. Now before I went to bed, the door was closed. The door itself is hard to open because it's slightly askew and not lined up with the frame. And even I have trouble opening it. Not to mention a large dog kennel was sitting in front of the door. When I looked at the door, it was wide open. The kennel knocked over and the room is dark and quiet, besides the dogs yapping. I, being stupid, walked to the door, looked inside with a flashlight and didn't see anything. Closed the door, picked up the kennel and went back to bed. Woke up the next morning and the closet's open again in the same state, but this time the bedroom door is open now too. I haven't had an experience again since then and it's been almost two years. I've been having a lot of trouble sleeping recently, which I've never had before. I wake up in the middle of the night, sweating and feeling anxious with a racing heart. I told my parents and they advised me to go to the doctors to have it checked out. I went to the doctors and everything was fine. He said that it was just a nocturnal panic attack and I needed to monitor my coffee intake. I did, but things didn't change. The same thing happened a few nights after seeing the doc. I woke up in a sweat, but this time with the words, your eyes are blue and mine are green, racing across my mind. It was really bizarre. I just assumed I was in that weird awake but sleep state. Eventually I went back to sleep and woke up the following morning with that sentence still ingrained in my mind. I was so confused because I'd never been so fixated on something so random. It was involuntary. A few hours passed and I was back to normal. Later on that day, my dad came home from being at my neighbor's house, carrying a drawing from the neighbor's daughter, picturing both of our families together. We're close family friends. I took a closer look at it and my heart practically fell out of my chest. She didn't have a blue or green crayon for our eyes, so she had to put a footnote saying the following, your eyes are blue and mine are green. Either the simulation glitched, I'm having a weird spiritual synchronistic awakening, or this is just a huge coincidence. I'm just so confused. When I was about five, I woke up every night at about the same time, I think, and would turn my bedroom light on and then go get into bed with my parents and go to sleep. On one particular night, I woke up as I had been, turned on the light, then went and got into bed with my parents. This time, I faced the hallway where my room's light was shining and what came out of the complete darkness beyond the living room? A figure, roughly seven feet tall, dressed in a white hooded robe with its hands together to where the robe sleeves came together. Also, there was just blackness where a face should have been. It was not quite walking and not quite gliding, just coming towards me. I didn't feel malevolence nor fear of it. However, I did freak the fuck out because there was something there that shouldn't have been. 
I woke my parents and my dad ran off the ghost. Also, I should point out that this happened around the time that my grandmother passed away. I don't know if that's important, but I always made that correlation. So this story is a true story that I wasn't supposed to hear or know about. But I happened to overhear it from my dad, who was telling it to our uncle over the phone. My dad has a loud talking voice, so it's not my fault I overheard. Backstory, my nightmares started around middle school. I don't remember much of the dreams, but they were creepy and kept me up most of the night, causing me difficulties during school, so my parents would have me pray nightly to help me sleep. It didn't help much, and the dreams continued until after high school and I just started college. Most of my uncles were shamans, and from what I've heard, so was my grandpa. He passed away when my dad was a little boy, and is reborn as my baby brother. That's why I heard. Now with the story. I didn't have class that day, and was walking upstairs to my bedroom, until I heard my dad chatting with my uncle. At first, I thought it's the usual family calling to check up on us talk, until I heard my name get mentioned. So I sit in my younger brother's room to listen. My brothers were at school. My dad says to our uncle, Yes, Dragon Crystal isn't having any more nightmares for a while now, and we're happy about it. Uncle. Well, what was the cause of the dreams? My dad tells him that apparently I had a brother that still clings to me from the afterlife, and wanted to cross over to reunite with me. But if he did, it would poorly affect our family, so our other uncle, a shaman, spoke with my supposed brother, and told him to let go of me, so that I can rest at night. I heard my uncle ask if I knew about this, and my dad responded with, No, it's best if she never found out about it, or it would have turned out bad. Well, I found out about it, dad, but I'm just pretending not to know about it. I'm sure if I ask about it, my dad will flip out and make a scene about it. Because he always makes a scene about anything that he wants to rant about. So even now, I still don't know why my ghost singer brother couldn't cross over. Since my dad changed the topic and started talking about hunting instead. Experience number one. Backstory, he used to hunt with a hunting rifle, but has now started alternating between crossbow and a bow, because it's quieter and easier to hunt them with a hunting rifle. My dad, like I mentioned, was out hunting, and I'm assuming had fallen asleep in his car while waiting for a book to appear. He looks out the window and sees this prize-winning book, his words, not mine, a couple feet away from him. Excited, he raises his gun, all set fire at it, because our other uncles have already gotten their prize book, expect him and he wanted to get one himself. But when he looks through the scope, there's nothing there. He lowers the gun and there's the book in plain sight. He raises the gun again to fire. Zip nothing, open space. Lowers the gun again. The book is still there, but looking away from my dad. Very confused, he raises the gun up again. Gone again. My dad's thinking, what's going on? He lowers the gun this time and the book is really gone. He was so confused and by then my uncles have returned to the car and they head home for the night. Nobody was able to figure out if the book was real, a figment of my dad's imagination or a forest spirit playing a prank on him. Experience number two. My dad was out hunting again with one other uncle at this newer area about three or four years ago, instead of at the area in experience one. Except it was almost winter when this strange and creepy encounter happened. My dad was already high up in his tree stand for hours and just waiting for a book to appear. It does, but it's too far out of range that he wouldn't be able to get a clear shot. When he notices a woman in a white dress walking around a few feet below him. He was confused why she was walking around in a dress in that condition and wanted to call out to her. But something in the back of his mind told him not to. So we just silently sat in the tree stand and waited. Eventually she walked away and out of sight, in the direction of where our uncle was located. My dad continues waiting for maybe another half an hour before climbing down and calling our uncle about the woman in the white dress. Our uncle, what woman? The one that walked in your direction half an hour ago. I never saw anyone and there shouldn't be anyone else but us here. They were both confused. 
but it was enough to scare our uncle into wanting to get the heck out of there. My dad didn't want to leave and instead wanted to stay a bit longer. After some convincing, our uncle talks my dad into leaving. When my dad processes to mock and tease him about the woman in the white dress, they both made at home perfectly fine. But our uncle is too scared to go hunting there by himself now, after what happened. Then a few days afterwards, my dad's leg just starts hurting and swelling up for a couple weeks. Our other uncle, who's a shaman, not a hunter, thinks maybe they offended or disturbed something while out hunting. My dad denies it, but was told to go back to the area during the day and apologize to whatever they might have disturbed. My dad, being a stubborn guy, refused to, but after a while, he and our uncle, the one who went hunting with him, went back and apologized. A few days after his leg was all better, as though nothing had ever happened. Creepy, and that's why I never want to go out hunting in the woods at night. Because anything can happen, and I hate being outside after dark. So around noon, I was making drinks for our guest, and normally I can carry a tray of four or five drinks perfectly fine. But when I picked up the tray this time, the whole tray just slipped over and the drinks, luckily it was just water or it would have been a sticky mess, spilled all over the floor. My coworker that's working with me and the hosts that placed the order for the drinks came to check on me in case I fell because they heard the cups fallen down. I helped maintenance sweep the water and ice down the drain before someone else takes a tumble. But I swear I felt a tug on my arm before the tray fell down. At least I've got co-workers who were caring and came to check on me in case I did get hurt. Weird thing is that this isn't the first time I've had this happen to me while I'm at work. The first time was at my very first job back in 2012, around the time Halloween while I was working the night shift at this Asian grocery store. I was one of the few open lanes and it was very, very slow. So I had my drawer open so I could count how much money was in my drawer. There's a soda cooler just to the left of me and I had a clear view of anyone coming up on my lane. As I was in the middle of counting my coins, I see a small boy peeking at me from in front of the cooler out the corner of my eye. So I close my drawer and turn to help him. And my lane is completely empty. I walk out and look around a bit confused since I didn't hear footsteps coming or going from nearby. So I go back to my register, reopen my drawer to resume counting and just as I start counting, I see the kid again staring at me as if he needed help with something. I wait a bit before I look up and when I turn my full attention, he's gone again. Then I heard footsteps coming from high me. I turn to see a coworker walking by and ask if he saw a kid run by. He tells me that he hasn't seen anyone walk by in either direction, which really confused me because I saw the boy twice out the corner of my eyes. Twice I looked up and he wasn't there. I tell my coworker I'm positive that I saw a kid looking at me while I had my drawer open. He thinks I just saw the Halloween decorations stuck on the cooler that looked like a kid staring at me. Backstory, my grandpa from my dad's side of the family passed away when he was just a kid, so I've never gotten the chance to meet him. I've only ever heard stories about him. But it's tradition for us to call our parents relatives, our grandparents, even though technically they're not, and it confuses me and my siblings all the time, but I'll stick to it. I overheard him talking this to our grandma a few days ago. Our dad has a very loud voice and we could hear him talking through the walls very easily. But due to this encounter, he hasn't been going hunting for a couple weeks now. Only time he goes is just to check his trail cams. He was out hunting on private property that belonged to our relatives. They gave him permission to hunt there. Our grandpa, my dad's uncle, had built a treehouse like stand above one of his pigeon pans. He allows our dad to use it because the temperature was dropping. So our dad started using it. Normally my dad leaves the hatch open to let in some light because our grandpa has a small lamp attached to his pigeon pan that he leaves on at night to keep the pigeons warm during the cold night. During one of the nights my dad was out there hunting, it was around midnight. He had closed the hatch because it was too cold. The entire hut was pitch black and the only sound was the wind and occasionally the pigeons fluttering around in their pan. When there was a sudden knock on the hatch, 
You confused our dad a bit because he knew our grandpa wasn't awake at the time. And if he was awake, he wouldn't come near because he would have seen our dad's car parked a few feet away and know our dad is there. Also knowing that if he did come, he'd scare away the deers grazing near the area. Our dad tells whoever it is to leave him alone and that he isn't doing anything wrong because he was given permission to hunt there. After saying that, the knocking stops. Then he hears what sounded like someone walking around nearby. He waits a few minutes for the sound to stop before opening the hatch to see who was walking, only to not see anyone or anything down below. After a few more hours of waiting and no deers appearing, my dad decided to climb down from our grandpa's tree hut to take a short nap in his car and to warm up. But not long after, he falls asleep, he hears a knocking on his window as if someone was there. He wakes up and looks around in case our grandma woke up early and saw him sleeping in his car. Nobody in sight and so he checks his phone to see it's about 4.30 or 5am and our grandparents house that's just past where his car's parked is still dark meaning they aren't awake yet. Confused, our dad goes back to the tree hut for a few more minutes before heading off to work at 6am. After a few minutes of nothingness, he heads to work and after work goes straight back to there to do some more hunting. This time, our grandparents were doing something outside, except they were over at their house and invited our dad to have dinner with them before he started hunting, which he accepted, then back up into the tree hut he went. Around the same time, the knocking started again. He again proclaimed he was given permission to hunt there and wasn't doing anything wrong. Again, the knocking stops and our dad thought it was over. Then suddenly the knocking starts up right next to the wall where he's sitting at. Our dad claims that time the knocking was so hard it caused the entire hut to start shaking. So he just sat there quietly and didn't make a sound or move an inch. Eventually the knocking stopped and our dad quickly got out of the hut, into his car and left for the night. On the way home he called our other relatives that practiced shamanism and explained everything to them. They checked and told him that it was a friendly spirit, telling him that he didn't want our dad to be hunting there alone anymore. It was okay with him checking his trail cams and hunting during the day, just not at night anymore. After we finished telling our grandma, she believes it's his father, our husband aka our real grandpa we never met, reaching out to him to be careful and that he's watching over our dad for going hunting alone instead of with our uncles. Our dad then tells her since that incident happened in the tree, but he's actually too afraid to go back there. He's willing to go and check his trail cams before dark, but not willing to hunt anymore. He then briefly mentions a couple days after the incident happened, that he was home in the middle of showering. My brothers were playing video games upstairs and I was watching YouTube videos on the couch in the living room when he heard a sharp knocking on the bathroom door. Our dad turns off the shower and opens the door, believing it was one of us knocking on the door to ask who knocked on the door. We all looked at him confusedly and claimed to have not have moved from our spots. He closes the door and starts showering again. We go back to what we were doing, only to hear him say sort of muffledly, come do it again. Only nothing happened and he later told our mom when she was gone home from work. Was it really our deceased grandpa? Maybe. Will our parents tell us if it is? No, probably not. Because they know we'll get scared by it and it might affect us mentally. Backstory. This happened several years ago before we moved to our current house and none of us knew about this large sum of money our grandma was storing away. But needless to say, our dad blamed it on me and my younger sister, even though we both told him we never knew it was there. So I've held off on telling the story because it's very much still a mystery on truly what happened. Especially since I wasn't home when our grandma and parents first realized it happened. I believe I was staying after school for a club I was part of or needed extra homework help, can't remember exactly. But nonetheless, I still took the fall for it despite not even realizing it was just hanging a couple feet above my own portable bank container. So, cause if any argument, cough, guilt tripping cough, that involves me and my dad will use this as an example to point fingers at me. My grandma basically raised me since I was born cause my parents were still in high school around the time I was born. So I respect her a lot, even though she's now started becoming very toxic and entitled. 
She's always helped keep my loose cash hidden and away from prying eyes because I don't have my own personal bank accounts at the time. The location of my portable bank was in the back of her closet stashed among her sewing items. The rare times where our parents would give us any allowance. Me, five or if I'm lucky, ten dollars. Younger sister, ten, maybe fifteen. Brothers and baby sister, twenty or more. Secretly, my grandma would sneak maybe an extra ten dollars into my bank because she believed it was at the time unfair that I only got five dollars while everyone else got more. Whatever, I rarely spend that on anything just yet and I just started high school at the time, but that's a separate story. I was sitting there when my phone, my dad's old flip phone, vibrates in my pocket. I check it and it's my mom asking about my grandma's now missing money. Apparently, when our grandma found out her cash went missing, our dad searched her closet and found my hidden portable bank. I told her I didn't know what she was talking about. They didn't buy it because if my portable bank was in there, that meant I knew about the money. In other words, I'm the guilty suspect. I dreaded going home because I'm about to get a major earful for something I clearly couldn't have committed while at school. Eventually I got home and our parents were already at the front door prepared to question me about the money as they were demanding me to just hand over the cash. And I'm just repeatedly trying to explain that I didn't take the money. They'll question why my bank was in the closet as well as why do I have so much cash in my bank? There was barely $200 in there. My grandma had over $1,000 that was stolen. When our grandma was about to mention that she's seen our younger sister stealing money from my bank, because our younger sister found out where my bank was and has been stealing my money for a while, before my grandma decided to intervene. So now the target is both me and our sister. Our dad spent the next four to six hours just interrogating us to admit that we stole the money and split it between the two of us. Our grandma then pointed out that the main pouch where the large majority of her cash was opened and taken, but the smaller pouch wasn't touched or disturbed in any way. Our dad, being a stubborn man he is, refused to believe that either me or our sister took and kept yelling at us to hand the cash over or get disowned. I then asked him how could I have stolen the cash if I wasn't home all day? And if I was home already, I'd have been in my room focusing on my homework instead. Which led to our dad becoming more enraged. Then after more hours of him yelling at us, our grandma started blaming it on her deceased mother and sisters, whom has been known to haunt her every chance they get along before they even moved to Minnesota. My grandma eventually started yelling threats to her sister and mother by saying, so after all these years now, you decide to pull this crap again? Why are you suddenly not doing anything more? Go ahead and show yourself. To this day, our dad still wants to point the finger at me, accusing me of taking the money, and will use this as any excuse to get pissed at me. Backstory. My grandma always mentioned that her mother and sister had passed away when she was very young. So I've never seen a single picture of them and only heard stories about them haunting her. Story number one, Midnight Garden Plot Haunting. Our grandma, uncle, aunt one, two, one is older and two is younger, but I never physically met two, only seen pictures and heard a voice over the phone. Along with dad, were at their plot of garden they've owned for a few years and had been plowing it all day. Aunt one noticed that it was getting dark and suggested that they head home for the night. Grandma refuses and tells them that it'll be too late by the time they get home and to just spend the night there instead. So they plow some more before eating dinner and getting ready for bed in their small garden, a hut they made when they brought the pot of land. They'd just started to fall asleep when they heard frightened laughter all around the hut and scampering above their heads, as if whatever was outside had climbed up on the roof. Note, this is Lao, and it's not the first time it happened to my grandma. Aunt Two is freaked out and crying now, wanting to go home. After a while, the noise stops and Aunt Wan asks if Grandma wants her to check outside, which Grandma promptly says, no, go back to sleep. I'll light a small fire near the doorway in case someone tries to get in. So Aunt Wan goes back to sleep and Grandma lights the fire. The rest of the night was quiet after that. And in the morning, the fellow things were scattered about, but Grandma ignored it and had everyone finish plowing before they headed home. Mystery two, mystery voices on the trail. Grandma and Aunt Wan were finishing checking things at their garden land again, 
But as they were ploughing the last bit of land, Aunt One hears men's voices and women as if walking in the, their direction. She mentions it's a grandma who stops to listen and just tells her to quickly finish ploughing in case it was Vietnam soldiers heading their way. Just as they finish, they also notice the voices had stopped too. Slightly nervous now, Grandma quickly grabs her things, handing Aunt Wan the lighter items while she handled the heavier ones and starts heading home immediately. Suddenly, the voices now start up again, this time behind them. Aunt Wan asks how the voices were behind them if nobody passed them. Grandma just shushed her and said to quickly get going. As they were leaving the area, they passed by an old tombstone on the side of the road, which Grandma was mentioned many times in her other stories, but didn't know who it belongs to. Story 3. Poltergeist figure. Again, Grandma, Aunt, One, Two, Dad and Uncle were at the garden. Except this time they had finished early and had just finished eating lunch, when Grandma decided to go to her aunt to have a chat, leaving Aunt One in charge of two, Dad and Uncle back at their plot. Not long after Grandma got to her aunt's plot to start chatting, when they hear horrified screams of terror, followed by rapid footsteps of Aunt One, Two, Dad and Uncle coming in their direction. As soon as they see Grandma, they clutch her tightly and trembling with fear. Grandma, not happy about this, and angrily asks them, I told you all to stay at the hut so that nobody takes our pots and dishes. Dad, but we heard something rustling in the bushes and laughter as soon as you left. Because of this, everyone, including our grandma's aunt, went back to their hut to make sure nothing was stolen or out of place. Sure enough, their pot that held the rice was missing. Grandma, just great, the Vietnam soldiers probably stole our pot when you guys took off running. To be honest, I'd run too. Story for another time. After a couple minutes of searching around the hut, they find the pot a couple yards behind the hut in the grain field. Rice was still in there, untouched. Grandma now realises who could have moved it, picks up the pot and loudly explains in an angry tone, Oh, you're that hungry, aren't you? If you're so hungry, take the food then. And don't bother my kids. You're mad because you're gone and not me, so terrorise me. Only leave my kids alone, you hear me? Before dumping the last of the rice onto the ground and storming back to where everyone else was waiting. That night, they slept at Grandma's aunt's hut instead of at their own. When they went back, everything was still the way it was.